Kay, and welcome to the K Files. And welcome, JP, this morning, my buddy. And we've got Lieutenant Sherrod. Good Back morning. Back again. Good morning. Faithful as can be. <laughs> and um, this morning we're going to talk about, well, first of all, let's talk about the Team Cold Case a minute. We have a, we have a board meeting today. We do. Um, we are on the board that oversees the K Files and all of that is Team Cold Case. It is a nonprofit. We do have fundraisers. We do raise money so that you can, so that we can pay out money for tips. It's that simple. The number's on the screen, 406-6736. We have a hotline number, which is that, um, that you can call if you know anything, anything at all. And you know what? Somebody knows something about all these cases, yeah. about all these cases. So, and it's anonymous, it's, it, isn't it? Totally anonymous. It is. Um, team people from the Team Cold Case Board will not know um, that information goes strictly to will law not. enforcement, and then whichever whichever agency is the tip needs mm -hmm. to go to, will uh, be the only uh, agency that knows about it, and then they investigate that tip, and if that tip leads them to information that leads mm -hmm. to an arrest, then that agency reports back to Team Cold Case and says, hey, that tip did such and such for us, and then at that time. Um, the, the board committee meets and we write them a check. Mm -hmm. This, this um, show is to help get tips so that we can solve unsolved murders. But number one, yes, number one, we need to solve unsolved murders. Number two, we need to give closure to families. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, um, serves this, this show serves a lot of purposes and if you know of anybody that you think might need to see the show might know something please tell them it's on YouTube they don't if they if they don't see it on television it is certainly on YouTube and we do rebroadcast the show Fridays at seven o'clock and other times in open spots so it's plenty of opportunity for people to see the program so anyway let's get started so let's what what case are we talking about this morning? We're going to um, show the, the old video of Major Misty Strickland talking about Travis Lynch, who okay. was our missing person case down there. Well, in she's very close to that case. She is. Uh, she was um, Travis's school resource officer uh, when he was in high school. And, of course, you know Misty grew up down in Middlesex, mm -hmm. um, and she, that's where she lives. And, and so she um, took this case to heart, and, and she's done a lot of work on it. And um, so we decided to just let her show the video of, of her talking about it before in the past. Okay, and then we'll elaborate a little we bit will. at the end. Okay, we can show that, Brittany. Travis Lynch. I've been writing about him every, I wrote about him before over the years, but since January I've been writing about him every week for seven months. Wow, Lyndall. Yeah, mm -hmm. every, that's you know, a lot. Well, I mean, there's there's a lot to it, you know. It, I mean, there's a lot to this case. So Travis was 21 years old. Uh, he was uh, he's from both Nash and Wilson. I mean, he grew up in right. Nash. We'll, we'll talk about that. But but he disappeared on Christmas Eve, 2003. Mm -hmm. And that's an older picture of him, right? Yeah. Like, well, a younger version of him, right. yeah. Um, well, I mean, I wanted to use something different than the one we use in the paper yeah. every week. You know, mm -hmm. we use that that picture all the time. So you're right. That that's one of his like his yearbook picture. Right. Probably. Right. Well, I mean, that's apropos for what yeah. we're going to talk about. Exactly. All right. So, so um, he goes missing Christmas Eve, 2003, and um, last seen with his girlfriend's family in in the Middlesex Bailey area. Okay. And like I said, I've been writing about it for six or seven months, um, but you have been involved in this case. For much much longer than that not just as an investigator but you were also uh travis's school resource officer when he was in school in high school that's that correct right? okay mm -hmm. so can you can you kind of i think it i think it's very unique for an investigator to know a person before they're a victim right mm -hmm. or, or to know about a person before they end up being a victim right. so can you kind of tell us what i think you're in a unique position to tell us what travis was like Okay, so um, we put SROs in the schools. That was relatively new back then. Um, and I was at Southern Nash, which is now middle school. Back then it was Southern Nash Junior High School, and it was seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Um, 
Travis was a ninth grader there when I came on board as an SRO and I think he was sort of inquisitive about the position and about um, me as a, a deputy and I just got to know him um, most of the time at lunchtime out there he would come and talk to me just like a regular ninth grade grader um, cars girls I mean he loved music um, he's at that age where he was trying to find himself so I would try to guide him and um, he was just real charismatic toward me uh, that's why I remember him so much um, and then you know unfortunately later this occurs and right. so. so I mean how did you um, uh, I mean having having known him before and then having to work on his missing persons case and and you know like we like we I just talked about with Sergeant Tinder someone who's missing for 16 years isn't really missing right I mean they're, they're well, more than likely dead so I mean what you know he I mean, hasn't that, contacted his family um, he hasn't made any purchases um, his car hasn't been seen he hasn't been seen um, Jackie has sort of that's the mother Jackie Lynch um, she's become part of my family throughout the 16 years um, she's been to family events she calls weekly and um, I have to set aside when she calls about Come 30 on, it's, minutes. It's more like daily. Ain't well, I mean, she's been it, calling me a little bit. Yes, I think it's a little bit more like daily. It depends. She goes in phases. Um, she might skip a couple of weeks, and then it it is. Um, it just depends on how she's feeling. Right. Um, but my children have grown up with Miss Jackie calling, so she's part of our family. Um, the biggest thing, and I want to stress this to the Middlesex community, um, they know they know exactly what happened um, there's several people that know and to bring closure to this mother who for the past 16 almost 17 years cannot have closure about her son I want them to understand that like I've told you before Jesus does not like ugly and it affects um, it, it can affect their loved ones right um, that's just how I feel about it um, there's been a lot of tragedy in the Middlesex Bailey area um, with people that are connected to this case and I just don't think until it's resolved um, that area won't settle down does that make sense yeah no peace in that area no peace it, it, it's just it's something there and um, just this week uh, I spent Monday and Tuesday with another detective out of state following up on some leads um, so it's active thank thankful thankfully to you and no, I mean, well to everybody it, um, it, the media putting it out there we need the media right. and sometimes the media gets a bad rap but we work together if we all work together and join yes, in and that's how we feel about this Misty and we really really do appreciate uh, Sheriff Stone please tell him that we yes. appreciate the relationship and the willingness to work with us on right. this. we really do um, and we'll say again uh, Misty, how important it is, you would say, call the number 406-6736. If you know anything, it's completely anonymous. It's mm -hmm. completely anonymous. We will not know. I will not know who you are. Um, I don't. We don't get involved in that part of it. Call. That is a fighting crime number, 406-6736, and your tip will be given directly to the authorities without any um, identity. Nice so yep. please, so if you know anything about, about your... I mean, how's it going? Well, well, I mean, we still follow up on any kind of tips that come in. Um, I don't even think we've ever talked about this, but um, back when um, Dick Jenkins was a sheriff, um, I was a, I was assigned before I got back to investigations. I was assigned to uh, the courthouse, and um, so one summer, um, Daryl Land, who was a detective, was working this case in and out. Some um, had this case, and Sheriff Jenkins said. Uh, Jeff, he said, look, he said, for the summer, he said, I'm going to take one of the school resource officers and put in your job. He said, for the whole summer, your job is absolutely do anything but Travis Lynch. So mm. I, I worked Travis Lynch's case for one whole summer God, under right. Sheriff um, Jenkins. And, um, wow. and I mean, we found out some stuff we didn't know, um, and but we didn't find anything out that, that would push us over the edge, um, so to speak. Wow. Um, and, you know, and since then, I've been involved still. Um, Major Misty Strickland's been involved. Uh, one of our retired deputies, Jeff Lucas, has been involved. Um, and we, you know, we work whatever leads or details we get. Um, it's sad, um, you know, 
Miss Jackie, who Travis's, I mean, uh, yeah, Travis's mom, calls Misty right regular. Um, and right now, Misty's in Quantico, Virginia, at the FBI NA Academy. So um, Miss Jackie called the other day, and I had the, the unfortunate pleasure of talking with her and, 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 and talking about we still didn't have anything um, to go on right now. And, you know, and she's still a mama in need. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, I mean, it breaks your heart every time you talk to her. Absolutely. Um, because you don't have any answers for her. And I guess that's the, that's the worst part of what we do is that, you know, when we don't have an answer, it, it's just hard to explain to the family why we don't have answers. Right, absolutely. Families need, I mean, you think about this, we've talked, JP and I have talked about several times, you know, the Christmas people, and this was another one of oh, them. Yeah. That was a great, you know, how do you think this mother feels, the family feels, every time Christmas every rolls time. around, a holiday, when everybody gathers, but guess who's not in the room? Exactly. That's how it goes. And, and it's, it's bad. not just holidays either, oh. all the time, but especially holidays. So now, if he disappeared Christmas Eve, mm -hmm. okay, on a timeline, do you know if he was with friends or family that night or <coughs> what the setting was or where his last known we, presence was? We know that he left, um, he, he was with his girlfriend, Carlicia. Um, and Carlicia said he had been drinking, so he lay down for a little while before he drove home. And then he got up and said he was driving to Wilson, and he was supposed to have called Carlicia when he got to Wilson. He never called her. And then the next morning, Carlicia called Miss Jackie and, and, and wanted to know where Travis was. And so at that point, the family filed a, a missing persons uh, case, and we've been working it ever since. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, got one more thing to tell you. Okay. So yeah. <clears throat> the last time I was here, um, we talked about Parker's Eagle Scout project. Yeah. Um, so he went to the board Tuesday night and he got approved. So we get to start fundraising. That is and, so um, good. Taking donations and um, so as soon as we started telling everybody, um, his godfather Scotty Parker mm -hmm. uh, was the first one to put a check in his hand. So he wow, got, um, I don't good. doubt that one bit. <laughs> Scotty wanted to make sure he was the he was the first, first one, one. To, first one to give his his godson a, a donation to it. So um, we we were very blessed. Parker worked hard on it and got his booklet ready for the Eagle Scout board, and he went for him Tuesday night and approved it. So we so start. Folks that were not watching that day, this project was is going is going to the benefactor is who? The benefactor is the uh, Fraternal Order of Police because mm -hmm. they own the monument. But what Parker's project is going to be is to um, raise enough money to uh, add the five missing names from the fallen officers memorial outside the courthouse, mm -hmm. and then he's going to put a um, one of those benches out there beside it, and then. Um, like a uh, flower, a permanent flower vase where people can put flowers and stuff like that in. So that is so good. wonderful. So hopefully we, uh, we're we going to set a date to, to um, sell chicken plates and then of course he's going to take donations and then raise enough money to get it paid for and get it done and then have a have a, a grand view. How old is Parker? He's 15. For a 15 year old to really have this train of thought yeah. at that age is wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just wonderful. Well, you know, and we talked about it last time on the show. He he grew up in this, um, and like I said, Scott is his godfather, so he's mm -hmm. been around it his he's whole life. He's been around law enforcement and, um, the whole time. And Rem remind me, how much money were you looking at that you needed to raise to well, have this done? Well, unfortunately uh, for me, Parker has a very expensive taste. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, we went, he wanted to add that bench, so now we're going to have to go up to about close to around $7,000 to get the whole thing done. So we'll raise it. And well, that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Oh, no, we're going to get it. The need, yeah. I mean, the, the project itself and, and what it means, oh, yeah. people are going to, most definitely. you know, give. There's no, oh, yeah, most definitely. no and, doubt about that. But, uh, he, you know, he wanted to put a bench out there so, like, if people, um, like, during police week and, yeah. you know, Memorial Week and stuff, when they go up to Washington, D.C., if, like, some of the family wanted to come down and just sit there and spend a few moments at the moment, they'd have a place mm -hmm. to see it and stuff like that. So... And if they wanted to put flowers out there in front of the, the memorial for their family members or whoever, I mean, so he, he wanted okay. to do all that. So it, it turned good. out to be a little more than we had originally thought, but it's going to be That's okay. okay. It's going to be nice. Oh, it, it's it going to be really when nice. When we finish, it's going to be nice. Yeah. So. I think so. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. So the case in Castalia, 
Um, you made an arrest on that, right. and I understood that you're still looking maybe for someone else. We are um, another person of interest. We are. We we believe that there was more involved. Um, Detective um, Josh Trull, who was here on the show, he, that's his case, and right. um, he's been. I mean, he works it all the time. I mean, he gets other cases, of course, but he works that when he when he gets moments, and he he's been doing. Tons of search warrants and, and things of that mattered to um, to try to get us additional leads to try to make a, an arrest. And mm -hmm. So we're just kind of waiting and see if we can get another um, break in that to, to be able to arrest more more people who we believe are involved. Well, fortunately, you can count on one hand how many cases y'all have we, we in can, Nash County, um, and that's really good. You got Randy Colgrove. We got Randy Colgrove, and of course, we got Letitia McNair. Letitia that I'm still McNair. Working on and, um, and I mean, you know, we've, we've said this before, we have some back in the 80s um, that were unsolved back in right. those days, but, you know, we lost all that paperwork. Yeah. And um, so we, we don't have anything to go off of. Right. Um, I don't even know any, I mean, I know a couple of the victims, um, but that's all I know is just yeah. that they were victims. Um, but, um, I mean, we, we have some back that date back to the 80s, but as far as recent are concerned, you know, we, we've, we've talked about them and, and they're mentioned in the team cold case book that we have and stuff like that. So. Well, we talked mainly today about Travis Lynch, and if anybody knows anything, anything at all, if you saw anything, please call the number on the bottom of the screen or call 459-4121. Um, and talk to, um, of course, Lieutenant Sherrod or uh, whomever that um, about that case because it's it's important. It's really important that we solve these crimes. So thank you for being with us yes, this morning. Absolutely. We'll see you the first of next month. I'll be here. Good to All see you, right. Good to see you, bud. We'll be right back with you on the K-Files right after this. Being prepared and trained is the best way to keep your family safe. The best way to be prepared is to learn from those who've spent a lifetime protecting us. Barnes Safety and Consulting LLC offers concealed carry classes with instructors who are law enforcement officers active and retired with more than 100 years of law enforcement experience. Monthly classes are taught year round with private classes and special group rates available. Classes are $75 and held in the Bailey area. Call or text 1-800-653-0643. Get your concealed carry permit and avoid becoming a victim. Okay, and welcome back. Um, so, we want to talk a little bit about this morning a murder case, quadruple murder case, that happened in Halifax County um, a few years ago. And, of course, it had not gone fully to trial yet, but I think they did make some arrest in the case, and, and they are um, actively, um, I mean, they are in jail. Um, there was a, I'll just kind of briefly, because this is kind of long, there was two couples that were playing cards. They were very good friends, and apparently the couple's house that they were at um, he had a gun shop, not a shop, he just had a lot of guns. Mm -hmm. And people knew and they would come and not really formal gun shop, but they would come and maybe purchase a gun from him sometimes. Probably had a lot of foot traffic in and out then. Probably. And I don't know if people thought, these people, these suspects thought that he had money, cash, or they were after the guns. Um, whatever, but it was robbery. Robbery, they did determine as the motive for this. But a lot of people were heartbroken. These two couples were a pillar, they were pillars in the community. I mean, well known, um, just just really, really, you know, were liked. And, and so it hurt a lot of people and, and the community was really mad. It's one of those situations where the community was just really, really mad. So um, anyway, they ended up arresting four suspects, four people. And they knew because it was a brutal, heinous, heinous crime. I mean, the way they did it, it, w it, was, it was very brutal. So they knew it was more than one, the mm -hmm. way it was done, with four people just law enforcement knew it was more than one person. 
So they did come up with four suspects. That's kind of to give you a little bit of a um, rundown on the case. Um, so anyway, after that, they're in jail. They're awaiting uh, trial. And what happened was one of the, let me get the story, that story up. And we can kind of read that one. Um, but while they're awaiting, awaiting trial, this one, um, one of the suspects decided to just say, evidently he's one that, he must be one that, the one that told, told on the others. He had to have been that, you know, I don't know if they arrested him first, it doesn't say. But anyway, um, well, it says the site can't come up. So anyway, so four arrested, one comes up about two weeks ago and says, I'm going to change my story. I, want, I need to change my story. Well, you know, everybody was really mad because the DA, I thought it was two people that the DA had to let, let go. Three. I did. Oh, okay. Three. I thought it was two. Three walked away. That's what everybody heard yeah. was two. There were four arrested. One changed his story. He must be the one that absolutely ratted on the other three. And um, the other three have gotten out. But what are you going to do as a DA? You know, everybody's really mad at the DA. But what are you going to do when somebody changes their story? I mean, it's a target. It says they I mean, didn't do to, it. Well, I don't know what was said. I, I Disclosure. I don't know what was said. I'm just using this for an example. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. They didn't do it. I did it. And, and tells the DA whatever, a convincing story. I don't know if he felt threatened. Yeah. I mean, what I do mean, you think? You, you, I mean, we can speculate. Yeah. But clearly the DA went from thinking he had enough to go to trial um, with charges against all To hold him in there. To something changing drastically to where he realizes now I only really have evidence to pursue charges against one. And I know that's a, that was a struggle to have made that decision. Oh, yeah. But you know, it happens a lot. It does happen a lot. It happens a lot. A lot. It really does. Um, it says murder char charges were dropped against three of the four men charged in the murders of the, um, they call it the, the quadruple murders in Enfield. It happened in Enfield, North Carolina, which is Halifax County. Um, so Jason Powell is the one that changed his story. Jason Powell. And, um, revealed that um he must be taking the rap now for all of it yeah evidently revealing that accusations made against the three other um yep. co-defendants leading to the district attorney dropping the charges so um he admitted to everything he admitted to everything i, I th there's got to be a reason why you would do that I mean, you know, he's probably going to get life. It's a quadruple murder. And you're letting the other three walk? I mean, I don't know. It's hard for me to believe that they didn't have anything to do with it. I totally agree. Before, during, or after the fact, I totally agree. I mean, so anyway, so what happens after that? So the three get out. Then we hear last week that mm -hmm. one of them had passed away. Had passed away. Mm -hmm. We didn't know how, but then I was sent a story on that from it was in the Roanoke Rapids newspaper, and it said that he um, overdosed. So um, at first, you know, it, there was a lot of speculation that he was probably murdered. Uh, he was not. It was definitely an overdose. He went to the Roanoke Rapids Hospital and they declared it an overdose. So that was an interesting case, um, is an interesting case. Um, and it'll be in, I really want us to cover this trial 
with this one person. This is going to be so interesting. Mm -hmm. It'll be so interesting to cover that um, because I don't know I'm if there, <clears throat> to what extent will there be a trial though if he's admitting. If he's admitting it, um, he's, doesn't he still have to go to court? I mean, uh, doesn't he still have to sentencing? For sentencing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, to what extent there will be a trial, I would say little to none. I guess none now. I mean, if in fact he has admitted everything like that story reads, right, it would be a moot point. Well, that's true. And so, anyway, that's, you know, that's how this is ending up. There is still the other two are out. I guess they're free to go. Um, Don, and one of the ones that had his charges dropped, Don Tavius Cotton had his charges dropped, but he remains, um, oh, one of them remains behind bars due to charges in other another charges. case. Okay, Imagine so he had that. some more charges. Um, Dartavius Cotton, so um, he's still in jail, but he won't be tried for this case. He will not be tried for this case. Jason Edward Powell um, is the one that will be charged with this case entirely now. So, I don't know the facts of the case to that extent, but I have a hard time believing that one person pulled off breaking into a house with four occupants. I know. Executing them all without any aid or assistance from, um, you know, somebody being with him. Right. I have a hard time believing that. I know. Well, very interesting case there. And we'll be right back right after this. We'll go, we'll hear some weather, and then we'll talk about another case. Being prepared and trained is the best way to keep your family safe. The best way to be prepared is to learn from those who've spent a lifetime protecting us. Barnes Safety and Consulting LLC offers concealed carry classes with instructors who are law enforcement officers active and retired with more than 100 years of law enforcement experience. Monthly classes are taught year round with private classes and special group rates available. Classes are $75 and held in the Bailey area. Call or text 1-800-653-0643. Get your concealed carry permit and avoid becoming a victim. Okay, and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed uh, Lieutenant Sherrod. Uh, we talked about Travis Lynch. Um, and, and, you know, as we get into these cases, I hear more because people sitting at home are getting involved in the cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes they can tell me almost as much as I'm given on TV. Mm -hmm. We're given on TV. You know, they'll say, oh, well, I remember, you know, well, when she left that, you know, talking about Tammy Grady, one of them talked about Tammy Grady. When she left that motel, I'll bet she, see, they, they just get all involved in it because the more we talk about it, the more involved they are in it. And, and and then they go back and They talk get about interested it. and they're talking about it and hopefully somebody will say something. We talked about a kind of a interesting case last week, mm -hmm. James Crisp. James Crisp. He owned the record store for years and years and years. He was kind of a pillar of the community mm -hmm. there too. I mean, people mm -hmm. highly respected. Uh, people kind of hung out there because they said he played music in there and people just kind of came and, and hung out and one day um, somebody broke in his record shop well not broke in they came in his record shop and killed him and stabbed him tied him up mm -hmm. with an with electrical a, cord right yeah extension cord mm -hmm. and um, really really bad if you know anything about that case um, downtown Wilson and they say Wilson started going downhill after that. They said it was thriving. The downtown was really thriving during that time. And after that, it just started going downhill, uh, um, is what people tell me, so that have memories. And a lot of people, as we said last week, a lot of people have memories of that record store. They, from Rocky Mount, I hear people all the time saying, oh, I used to go there to buy my records. Um, so, and said he was such a nice man, just, such a nice man. Um, but anyway, he was he was stabbed, tied up, as we just said, with an electric cord. 
Um, I think the motive was robbery, mm -hmm. is, is what they said. And when they left, they left the front door open. They left the door mm -hmm. open. So, um, and then there were some witnesses that said, well, we saw him running down the, some people running down the street, not him. Saw people running down the street afterwards, you know, but you gotta place the person in the store, kind of. So they had some witnesses, but then um, they made an arrest. And how many did they arrest? I was thinking three. Three, something like that. Mm -hmm. Three. They made an arrest, and um, the mu the wife was so glad, felt so much better about the situation because they said she didn't sleep a night since this happened, and of course not. I mean, afraid that they might come after her, and plus upset, you know, about what happened to her husband. So um, she was relieved. She really was when an arrest was made. And then after that, um, for some reason, they had to let him go. They just didn't have the evidence; just didn't pan out. So probable cause versus beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, is, is a lot of ground game that you've got to make up for. Yeah, <clears throat> just and like the, the DA up in Halifax. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's same thing. That's right. And and the. Um, you know, this all boiled down to a witness mm -hmm. that would not testify. The witness wouldn't testify in this case, this, the, the James Crisp case. Um, they lost their witness. So what are you going to do? You don't have any concrete evidence. So had let him go. And of course, the mother was, I'm sure, distraught mm -hmm. about this and the family. And so, if you know anything, this case is still out there. It's still unsolved. So if you know anything, please call the hotline number or please call the Wilson Police Department. It's very important to give these, this, these families closure. I'm sure Ms. Crisp has passed away, but we know that she had a daughter, so we, you know, I feel like the daughter is still living, and other family members, maybe grandchildren. So we want to give the family closure. So they if you know it. anything, mm -hmm. they deserve it. So that's the case we talked about last week. That's kind of a recap, recap that I wanted to bring um, back up. So I um, want to talk a little bit about baby Nash. And we're hoping that uh, Lieutenant Seifman next week will talk a little bit about it from Rocky Mount. He'll be here from Rocky Mount Police Department. <clears throat> this happened on February 7th, 2007. Around 1.15 p.m., a homeless man was searching the dumpster behind the food line on Harbor West Drive in Rocky Mount when he came across a Cheetos bucket. And, you know, that Cheetos bucket is famous now. That's, yes, it is. That's the, the number one thing they have in this case, a Cheetos bucket. When he saw the Cheetos bucket, he saw what he thought was a doll. Isn't that amazing? He, he picked it up by the leg and realized it was a real baby. Imagine how he, wow. He notified law enforcement. The baby was in the, in the bucket but first. Material that appeared to be a sheet that was covered in blood was found um, found um, up in the corner of the dumpster. Rocky Mount Police Department started investigating and revealed that the newborn was a white male, possibly born around 2005-2007. So, okay, two days old. Two days old and still had his umbilical cord attached. Around the umbilical cord was an elastic hairband. Another elastic hairband was around the baby's neck. Under the hairband, a long brown piece of hair was found and submitted into evidence. Well, wait a minute now, the hairband, wait a minute. The hairband was around the baby's neck. Did it? I'm sure it ever so slightly compressed the uh, baby's ability to breathe. So 
is that how the baby died? Or, you know, I didn't know if it was just from being in the weather, being in the dumpster, it is February, being in the dumpster, but this is something I didn't pay attention to before. We need to ask Lieutenant Seekman. Mm -hmm. So. I would assume that it was, uh, it played a role in strangulation. Yeah. Oh, wow. I hadn't heard that before, but anyway, that's interesting. Every time you read this, reads this over and over, you get something new out of it. And still had his umbilical cord attached around the umbilical, I'm gonna read this again, around the umbilical cord was an elastic hairband. Another elastic hairband was around the baby's neck. Under the hairband, a long brown piece of hair was found and submitted into evidence. There was dirt and granular um, matter on the newborn and in his mouth, all, oh, and an abrasion on his chest. The medical examiner um, noticed that the baby was alive um, at one time. He had, so he did live mm -hmm. through the birth. So, and according to this, it looks like they believe he lived for up to two days. Wow. That's terrible. Oh, he had air in his stomach and lungs. Um, and, and was with evidence of a live birth. And lung, I don't know. Okay, the Cheetos bucket was not said, was not sold in the Rocky Mount area at the time. Well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Where was it sold? Now, that's, that's interesting. Okay. Apparently, it was only sold like in northern states mm -hmm. north of here. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. Huh, interesting. So did somebody just come by, I mean, from out of town on, on 95 or 64 or 301? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's right there yeah. on 301. Yeah. Food line is off 301 right there, mm -hmm. sitting on the side of 301, this particular one. So, um, golly day, this is, you know, Approximately, uh, the baby weighed approximately seven pounds, um, nearly 21 inches long. He was a full-term, full-term baby, brown hair. Um, for the last 14 years, the only evidence to go on was the Cheetos bucket and the sheet with blood. Um, that is until Ancestry DNA became so now they've got DNA involved in it. And this is, and I believe this is what uh, Lieutenant Seifman has alluded to, that they're working on DNA. Rocky Mountain Police Department announced February 2020 that they, they were submitting DNA to, to find family members of baby John Nash. They had not released their findings as of yet. The mother would have been pregnant around May to June of 2006 through January 2007. The mother, mother could have been uh, up north where the Cheetos bucket was sold, or it could have been coincidence. If you know someone who was pregnant around that time and did not have a baby, report it. Interesting. So, I mean, do they stand a good chance if, if, if this person just dropped it off and they were from up north, I mean, I could see a scenario where it could be slim. unsolved for indefinitely never yeah. especially if they happen to be you? traveling through now the game changer is the dna yeah yeah exactly because everybody and their brother currently are on this kick of wanting to find their heritage their background their yeah. dna everybody's mailing in swabs to go into a database if any extended family member of this child has submitted dna um almost immediately mm -hmm. they could um they could identify well i can only hope this is on youtube so i can only hope that somebody up north may see it they know they know that their loved one did not have a baby was pregnant and did not have a baby i mean you know or they could be from here they could i don't know where the cheetos bucket would have came from but um, I've never seen a Cheetos bucket. I haven't either. I, they keep talking about the Cheetos bucket. Mm -hmm. And the reason I haven't, they don't sell them around here. But um, I would like to see a Cheetos bucket. 
I really would. The only one I've seen is um, the picture online on Facebook. Yeah. Somebody has really started pushing this story recently within the past week or two, and I'm assuming there must be something in the works real big Uh, on this particular case. Wow. I read it last night, as a matter of fact. That's Um, great. um, There's some uh, behind-the-scenes pressures on Rocky Mountain to come forward to say, look, did you submit this DNA. Somebody yes. is offering to do a DNA analysis. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. People were really interested in this case here. And um, they've got a lot of evidence. Mm-hmm. They have got a lot of hair. I mean, you know, they've got, they found hair on the body. That's so hopefully, but now one of the things that Lieutenant Seifman brought up was the DNA lab is so far behind this so was far an behind independent in processing yeah this was not like an SBI DNA right. this was like independent. A, an independent DNA um, person mm-hmm. has come forward to Rocky Mount and had offered their services free of charge well they need to take advantage I'm sorry but they need to take advantage of that um, because the other labs are so so far you know, all these labs are just, the sex offender lab, the Attorney General, I was just at a uh, forum that the Attorney General gave, and he said, do y'all know when I came here, there was um, 16,000 sex offender rape kits. Rape kits, not sex offender, rape kits in the lab unprocessed. That's mind blowing. I couldn't believe it when he said that. I said, what? And he said, you know, they're still not all processed. He said, but the numbers, of course, he was patting himself on the back. But the numbers are way down. But these labs, it's inexcusable Mm -hmm. that they're just not getting the information out. Here goes the DNA lab. So hopefully they can get this information back and something will come up. Um, because this is just terrible. The baby was two days old and perfectly alive, seven pound baby, 21 inches long, I mean, and just um, left in a dumpster to die um, with a hairband. There it is. Now there's a Cheetos bucket. Very good work, Brittany. That's what the baby was in. Wow. Mind-blowing. Anyway, if anybody knows anything, of course, you know the drill. 406-6736. Please call the Rocky Mountain Police Department. Um, you can call Crime Stoppers, 977-1111. Um, any way you can to get the word out. It is completely anonymous. We, As we said earlier, um, we do not no we do not want to know we just want to know that it's solved that's what we want to know there's up to fifteen thousand dollars that you can get so um and and we do pay out we just paid out about a month ago um a nice sum of money so um if anybody knows anything at all please come forward well so um, next week, we'll talk about some more interesting cases. We'll, we'll see what Lieutenant Seifman has for us. Uh, bless her hearts, Rocky Mount. <laughs> we, can't, we said the sheriff de- Sheriff's Department has, you know, just very few cases, we said this morning. But Rocky Mount Police Department, you know, they've just got a wealth of cases, and, and they're just working them as hard as they can. Um, so they have, we don't know which case they'll be talking about because they have quite a few cases and quite a few unsolved murders. So um, they'll be here next week and we'll uh, see what Lieutenant Siegman has to say. So make it a great week, everybody. Thank you, JP. Thank you for having me. Go outside and you know, yes. play some golf, do yeah. something. Yeah. It'll be a it's great weekend. Great weekend, great weather. So get out, as he said. And spring is March 20th, so it's coming. It's and right around the corner. Isn't um, daylight savings time coming up it is. this week? So mm. set your clocks. Anyway, have a great day.
Being prepared and trained is the best way to keep your family safe. The best way to be prepared is to learn from those who've spent a lifetime protecting us. Barnes Safety and Consulting LLC offers concealed carry classes with instructors who are law enforcement officers active and retired with more than 100 years of law enforcement experience. Monthly classes are taught year-round with private classes and special group rates available. Classes are $75 and held in the Bailey area. Call or text 1-800-653-0643. Get your concealed carry permit and avoid becoming a victim.